like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak here and be in this beautiful city. Um, I'm normally a fairly calm speaker and I try and go through things slowly, uh, but I had a lot of coffee this morning, so <laughs> if you think I'm going too fast, stop me. So the, the topic of today's talk is Ensemble Carmen Inversion, and in some sense, this is a continuation of Gear's talk, the first talk which opened the meeting. Um, in that, I will be talking about inverse problems and parameter estimation um, from the perspective of Ensemble Kármán methods. But I have a particular view on this topic, which is uh, based around viewing the algorithm as a derivative-free optimization technique rather than as a Monte Carlo method. And uh, there are really three things that I want to convey in the talk. Uh, one is to give you my perspective on the methodology as derivative-free optimization. The second one is to show you how, nonetheless, ensemble Kármán methods can be employed to do Monte Carlo Markov chain and solve Bayesian inverse problems as well as optimization problems. And uh, thirdly, to show you how constraints can be incorporated into the method. So I'll, I'll emphasize those three messages as we go through. But a key take-home idea is that uh, I want to explain to you the optimization perspective on this methodology. Um, the work is joint with many, many people, and I'll try and tell you who those are, who those are as we go along. OK, so the, I'm going to divide the talk into three main sections. The first one, what is ensemble Kármán inversion? I'll make connections with the history of the subject as, uh, as Gear introduced on Monday. Um, I will explain to you how I think of it in terms of optimization. So that's the purpose of the first section of the talk. Uh, the second section of the talk is concerned with using ensemble Kármán inversion to learn about parameters in climate models. And um, I'm going to frame this in terms of uh, parameter learning from time averages of data in complex, meaning in this context, chaotic dynamical systems. And in that section, as well as showing you how the ensemble Kármán inversion can be used to optimize parameters, I'll also show how it can be used in combination with Monte Carlo Markov chain and Gaussian process regression to perform uncertainty quantification. So in this section of the talk, I'll be combining ensemble Kármán inversion with ideas from machine learning to do uncertainty quantification. And then in the third section of the talk, I want to show you how the optimization perspective uh, is very naturally combined with constraints. That's an idea that's been in the community for some time, goes back to an idea of Dennis McLaughlin, and I want to explain it to you in a more general context. And I welcome questions and interruptions, not only if I'm going too fast because of the coffee, but just generally if you would like clarification. So um, what is ensemble Kármán inversion? So by ensemble Kármán inversion, I refer to using ensemble Kármán methods to learn the value of parameters. So this has a long history. Well, relatively, it depends who you're talking to. If you're in machine learning audiences, a long history means more than five or 10 minutes. In data assimilation, it maybe means decades. So learning parameters goes back to work of uh, Jeff Anderson, who talked about learning uh, single small numbers of parameters, um, and, and this follow-up paper here. There was early work about learning a whole field of parameters, an ill-posed inverse problem through this methodology. And um, as Gear described, um, work of Oliver and Reynolds showed how one could iterate the ensemble Kármán method to derive um, an optimization, if you like, as I will show you, scheme for learning parameters. And uh, Gear himself has analyzed that further this year. Um, it's this perspective, the one of Oliver and Reynolds, that I want to build on in the talk today. But let me first establish some notation and explain where ensemble Kármán inversion comes from by first talking about um, state space estimation in the ensemble context. Um, so I'm not doing inversion yet. I'm just doing state space estimation. And the purpose of this slide is to introduce you to my notation. And um, it, 
in absorbing this slide will mean that it's very easy to absorb later on in the talk how to incorporate constraints. So um, the, I, what I'm writing down here is um, the ensemble Kármán method uh, due to gear, and uh, it also gives a perspective on uh, Kármán filter. So the, the setting is we have a, a dynamics model, which I will assume is nonlinear with additive noise. Psi is the propagator. And I assume we have linear observations. So Y is the data, and it's a linear transformation of the signal V with additive noise. If Psi is linear, this is exactly the Kármán filter setup. And the idea behind the Kármán filter, which Gear generalized to allow for um, an ensemble perspective, is and the, the specific idea I want to work on in this talk is as follows. It's a sequential optimization perspective in which one predicts using the model. So given an ensemble Vn, n is time, and k denotes the ensemble member, you predict forward in time using the dynamics model. So every Vn k gives a prediction Vn plus 1 hat k. And then you solve an optimization problem. So this notation is a little bit messy, but um, just in words, there are two terms in here. One says, so this is an objective function as a function of v, and we're going to minimize it. The first term says, let's stay close to the prediction, and it's weighted by some covariance that I'll come to in a second. And the second one says, let's stay close to the data, and that's also weighted by covariance and that you minimize this. I'll come back to what the covariances are in a second. And that gives you um, the, the next ensemble prediction, at, uh, the next ensemble particle member at time n plus 1. So it's a combination of predicting and solving a quadratic optimization problem. And uh, as almost everyone in this room is very clearly aware of, even if the dynamics are nonlinear, this optimization problem is quadratic, and you can solve it analytically. So normally, the Kármán update formulae are not written in terms of this optimization, but rather in terms of the solution of this optimization problem using the Kármán gain. Okay? But I want to keep the optimization perspective because it's useful later on in the talk when we add constraints. So um, Gears innovation um, over and above the, well, let me just say what the Kármán filter does. So the Kármán filter doesn't run an ensemble. Rather, in the linear case, uh, linear with Gaussian additive noise, you can solve this problem uh, in a closed fashion within the class of Gaussians. And uh, Cn plus 1 hat is simply the predictive Kármán covariance. So this, there's a formula for this. Um, Gears innovation was to say, we can do an ensemble method. We can look at nonlinear problems as well as linear problems. And in the ensemble method, we estimate this covariance from the empirical covariance of the predicted particles. And that's an enormously powerful idea because it means two things. Firstly, it enables us to deal with nonlinear problems. And that was also possible anyway within 3D VAR, but in addition, or cycled 3D VAR. But in addition, the ensemble can be used for numerous tasks. Uh, one task which Gear has emphasized is to do uncertainty quantification. But that's not the perspective I want to emphasize. I will talk about uncertainty quantification, but it will not be directly using the ensemble to compute uncertainty. The perspective I have is that um, this is a state estimation scheme which cleverly combines information from different parts of the state space. And that's the... So I'm not, I don't think of this at the moment in terms of uh, uncertainty. Simply, you running multiple copies of the model, they interact, and that enables you to solve a nonlinear state estimation problem without having to compute derivatives. OK. That was state estimation. But um, what I want to talk about is finding parameters or solving inverse problems which would appear to be somewhat different. So I'm going to write down a generic inverse problem of finding parameters theta from data y, which is assumed to be found from applying g, some nonlinear map, to theta and adding noise. Now, throughout this talk, a guiding principle behind these algorithms is that evaluating g is expensive. 
Okay, so I want to find theta from y. So an example I'm going to give, two examples I'm going to give, uh, g will be evaluation of a GCM, and theta will represent um, parameters in a, in a subgrid scale model. So that speaks to the fact that every time you see g in this talk, you should realize that it's an expensive evaluation. G is something I don't want to differentiate because it's a hard piece of computer code, and it takes a while to evaluate. I want to minimize the number of evaluations I make of g. OK, so there are no dynamics in this, but I want to employ the setting on the, of the previous slide. So let's introduce trivial dynamics, theta n plus 1 equals theta n. And I also want, if you think about how the Kalman filter works on the previous slide, the ensemble Kalman filter, the fact that this optimization problem was quadratic and has an explicit formula, was, it, didn't require non, it, re, it didn't require linearity of the dynamics model, but it does require linearity of the observation. So um, for that reason, um, as Gear explained uh, early in the history of this subject, one can write down a new variable, w, which is just the, the, the forward model, g, applied to the parameter theta n. And then the observations are linear with respect to w, even though uh, g of theta G, trans G, which is nonlinear, transforms theta. Now, this I can rewrite as a state space, state space estimation problem by introducing the variable v, which is the parameter theta, and w, which is g applied to theta. Psi is then this nonlinear map, theta g of theta, and h is uh, this linear map, zero identity. And then this inverse problem has been reformulated as a state space estimation problem. And it's in exactly the form of the first slide, except you might ask, you know, wh what is this data? Because there was no time. I've introduced time as an algorithmic construct. There was no data. Uh, there was no time in the data. It was just a single instance of data y. So for the purposes of this talk, just think of the data y n plus 1 as being identically equal to y at every step. There are other things you can do. You can randomize it, and those are details as far as this talk is concerned. OK, so if I do that, I get an algorithm, and it's an algorithm for updating the parameters. Remember, the goal is, let me just refocus on the goal, because you, you need to remember this equation. Y is g of theta plus eta. So I, I want to find thetas which are close to y. So you see y minus g of theta occurs in the algorithm. And uh, here it is. This is the discrete time uh, ensemble Kalman inversion. It's the result of applying uh, Gears ensemble Kalman methodology to the state space reformulation of parameter learning. And it's an iterative technique. N is the iteration number. J is the ensemble number. You can see the coffee in the way that this green thing is moving. Sorry about that. Um, so the parameter at n plus, the jth parameter at n plus 1 is the jth parameter at n plus this um, innovation term, which is, which is an, an operator that I'll come to in a second, applied to the, distant, the difference between the data, which you just think of as this fixed y, and the application of the forward model to the parameters. And in here are covariances. There is empirical covariance in the data space, that's CGG, and there's a cross covariance from the data space, sorry, from the parameter space G to, from the data space G to the parameter space theta. Okay, so that's the algorithm, and there are lots of variants on it, but that's basically ensemble Kalman inversion as an iterative method. Um, now, I want to give a particular perspective on this which is that if you iterate this, um, there is a natural underlying probabilistic way that you should think about scaling the covariance of the noise, gamma, which is to rescale it as h, where h is small, inverse gamma, and then think of theta nj as the approximation of a continuous variable theta j uh, at time nh. And if you, let, if you write that and let h go to zero, you get a system of ordinary differential equations that describe a continuous time limit of this algorithm. So you might ask, what, what that, is that just mathematics? What's the point of that, doing that? 
there are two reasons. The first thing is, it's much easier to analyze continuous time processes, and they give insight into the behavior of the algorithm. I won't stress on that in this talk, but there's a lot of analysis you can do with this, and it's very powerful for understanding ensemble Kalman inversion. And the second thing is that you can now discretize this continuous time limit and get different algorithms. And I'll show you the output that arises from doing so uh, in a moment. Now, I, I will, in a second, uh, when I come to some examples, show you simulations that come from this. And the simulations are based not on this discrete time algorithm, but on looking at the continuous time limit and applying an adaptive time step method to it. Okay, so two reasons for liking the continuous time limit. It gives uh, uh, analytical tools which give us understanding of the algorithm, and we have developed such, and it gives you new numerical methods. Okay, just to show you the power of this, um, I want to show you an example that comes from electrical impedance tomography, and this is work with Neil Charder and others. Neil is giving a talk uh, in the next session at noon. Um, you don't have to take in the mathematics of this example, but it's there for those of you that are interested. This is a medical imaging procedure, and I want to use this inverse problem example to get across one idea, which is that um, how you parameterize your unknown can make a massive difference to how effective these methods are. And I'm going to show you quite a complicated parameterization to solve this problem. But let me just tell you in words what the medical imaging problem is. Let's say you want to detect unhealthy tissue. That's the blue in here, embedded in healthy tissue. That's gray. So um, a EIT, this is also used to image subsurface, is based on um, applying currents around the boundary of a domain and measuring the received voltages at the same places. Then there's an Ohm's law that relates the voltages to the currents. And the resistivity matrix R depends on the internal properties of the medium. So if you make measurements of pairs of inputted current and measured voltages, you implicitly have information about the interior of this domain. And that's embedded in this uh, really beautiful PDE formulation that goes back to Isaacson and Samasalo, um, but the details of which you don't need to know. The key point is there's a nonlinear mapping from the interior properties of the medium to the data, which are measurements as of voltage responses to um, current input. So this can be formulated as an inverse problem. There's no time in this. Yes, so, cap, so the, cap, the conductivity of the medium is kappa, and uh, for the moment, I'm going to be a bit more complex in a moment, for the moment, I'm going to write that as the exponential of u, and you should think of u as the unknown, but I'm actually going to parameterize u further on the next slide. And the reason to write it like this is just to emphasize that the conductivity has to be positive. Okay, so in these problems, what you're really interested in is uh, just two types of media, um, media which are um, piecewise constant, if you like, and the, the unknown is the interface between the two types of tissue, healthy in blue, unhealthy in red. Um, there was some discussion in Gear's talk, in fact, I think it was in response to Craig's question about whether everything has to be Gaussian in this formulation. Um, it, it doesn't, um, but th there are many reasons why Gaussian random fields are useful. But one key point to appreciate is a Gaussian random field never looks like this. Right? So you're not going to be able to describe this with a Gaussian random field. The way we approach this problem is to work with a level set function, which will be Gaussian in, in a priori. Um, and then we calculate uh, the, the interface as level sets of that continuous function. Um, but then it turns out that the length scales in that level set function are crucial to be able to find interfaces of this type. And so we also introduce the length scale of the level set function as part of the parameter. And indeed, Gaussian fields have smoothness parameters associated with them, and we also learn those parameters. So what we actually do in, in applying the ensemble Kalman version is work with a continuous field that looks like this, together with parameters that represent the uh, length scale and the smoothness of this function. As this iteration proceeds, you notice that the length scale is changing. It's becoming longer. That's because we're learning it from the data. 
uh, we're also learning smoothness. And if you like, smoothness is about parsimonious approximation. So that's algorithmically, functionally, where we work. But the point is, if you threshold that function, color it red where it's positive and blue where it's negative, this is actually what we compare with the data. And you will see, if you look at the last image here, that we've that, this one, that we've done a good job of learning the truth, which was there. Okay? So the purpose of this example was to emphasize that, and this is something that's well known in, for example, subsurface inversion, how you parameterize um, has a massive impact on how effective these methods are. Here, not only did we use level set method to enable us to deal with piecewise constant functions, but we also learnt properties of the underlying continuous function, such as its smoothness and a, and, and a basic length scale. So that was that specific example. I'm finishing this section. The other meta message in this section was, um, I think about ensemble Kalman methods as optimization methods. I haven't shown you anything about uncertainty. I'm simply running multiple copies. I use the multiple copies to compute covariances. But in a sense, those are just compute. These are derivative-free optimization techniques. And the fact that you have multiple copies enables you to look at differences of the response of the system to different parameters. So if you look at this system of ordinary differential equations, it involves uh, all of the current ensemble, at the evaluation of G at all of the different members of the ensemble. These all interact. And you can think of these as, as surrogates for derivatives. And just remember that my interest is in G being expensive. So in that example I gave you, G involved solution of an elliptic partial differential equation. And now as we go on, it's in the next section, G will be evaluation of a, a GCM. OK, so I like optimization. If you want three words to summarize the talk so far, ensemble Kalman version as optimization. Um, but in the, purpose, the purpose of this talk is to show you how it can be combined with simple ideas from machine learning to do uncertainty quantification, but not in the standard ensemble way. So let me just say, so the standard, on, the, what, the ensemble Kalman method is great because it works with a small ensemble. And if you look at the talks at this meeting, there's lots of talks about optimizing the ensemble so that it represents covariance. And that's nice, but I would say it's always going to be limited by the fact that we use two things. The fact we use small ensembles, that's the beauty of the method, and by the fact that it, the ensemble Kalman method is not statistically consistent with the posterior distribution except in the linear case. So I'm going to give you a different perspective where we uh, use the ensemble Kalman evaluations to train a Gaussian process which describes the response function G and then use that within Monte Carlo Markov chain. The point of that is that we replace an expensive evaluation of G. We just do a few of them in the ensemble Kalman inversion and we replace it by a Gaussian process which is cheap to evaluate and we can then run Monte Carlo Markov chain millions of times. Okay, that's the basic message of this. So um, this is joint work with uh, a number of collaborators at Caltech. Emmett Cleary, who's a PhD student. Alfredo Gabuno, who's a postdoc. Uh, Shi Wei Lan, who was a postdoc and is now at uh, Illinois. And Tapio Schneider, who is in um, climate science. 